And uh, today I want to share a word from uh, the book of Jeremiah that we read. And I hope it's an encouragement to you um, because it is an encouragement to me to know the kind of God that we have. Let me, let me just have a prayer as we go to the word of God. Father, we thank you again for this time of worship and praise. Thank you for a uh, family of worshipers that gathers together and participate together serving you. Thank you for each one. And Father, now as we open your word, may you speak to our hearts and minds and bless us as you do. Show us your ways. And Father, I pray that uh, nothing will go uh, wrong with the technology, that uh, everything will go according to your plan so that there is no interruption. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. So one of the, uh, one of the um, readings today was taken from the uh, Haftorah section. Actually, our parasha was Parasha Bihar at On the Mount, and uh, the Haftorah section was taken from Jeremiah. Oh, uh, yeah, so um, we will start and go into what God put on my heart to share with you today. I have a couple of questions for you to think about, and um, you probably ask this yourself many times. Sometimes we face circumstances that seem too big to handle, don't we? We all face that kind of situation. Maybe you're going through something like that right now. Uh, let, just, let me just say that the family situation here, uh, my daughter has faced challenges and my, you know, our children face challenges. So we try to help. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but uh, sometimes we face things that we don't know where to go. We are confronted with problems that we believe are too difficult to resolve sometimes. How are we going to take care of this? How are, what is the way out of this situation? Uh, and we we find ourselves in, in difficult times. Sometimes we tell ourselves, oh, this is too hard for me. Oh, no, I cannot do this. Oh, this is too much. I'm not able to do this or that. And uh, sometimes we get discouraged about all this, right? We, we need to make sure that we go to God's word because the Bible tells us, as we have read, there is nothing too hard for God, for our Father. We're going to go back to that during the sermon today. There is nothing too hard for the God that we believe in. I probably mentioned this before. I Forgive me if I repeat myself. You know that older people do that. But uh, uh, I remember when I, when I talk about this, I remember when I was pastoring a a Spanish congregation, and um, there, there was a, there was a, um, a Mexican man, very faithful man. His name was Felipe, and he used to, at the end of the service, uh, we shake hands and uh, we would have a time of fellowship. How are you doing? And I, and I would ask him, Felipe, how are you? And he would say, Oh, my, I'm doing great. My Diosito is is helping me all the time. And Diosito is a Sort of an endearing form of the word Dios, which is God. So Diosito is a diminutive, sort of an endearing familiar term, meaning my little God. My little God has helped me. And I was always used to tell him, Felipe, I don't know what God you believe in, but the God of the Bible is not a Diosito. It's not a little God. It's our great God. It's an awesome God. It's a one true God. He can do all things. Nothing is too difficult for him. And so uh, that, uh, that is a good reminder to us. Our God is an awesome God, says the song that sometimes uh, we, we sing. And so I, of, of the reading of the Haftarah from Yirmayahu, Jeremiah chapter 32, uh, we read the passage today from verse um, uh, 16 to 27. Uh, I just want to... Um, give you a little background uh, because this is a time when uh, Israel and Jerusalem were under siege uh, 
King uh, Zedekiah was the king and the uh, King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon was, uh, had Jerusalem under siege and he was about to conquer it. And so uh, Jeremiah was there in Jerusalem and God he asked him to do a few things, to buy a field, uh, the beginning of chapter 32 tells that, and to buy a field for, with his cousin and and uh, to recover part of the land. And, and God tells him, you are going to be uh, taken uh, into exile and some of you will die. And, uh, you know, he, God tells him everything that's going to happen because of the disobedience. Uh, but then uh, there is two verses there that, that catch my attention. The first one is verse 17. When uh, Jeremiah uh, starts this prayer, well, actually, in verse 16, is after giving the purchase, you know, there was a purchase of a, of a piece of land. He gave a contract to Baruch, which many believe is the one that wrote, uh, was a scribe to write the book of Jeremiah as dictated by Jeremiah. Uh, he did a contract to Baruch, and then he said, I pray to Adonai, verse 17, Adonai, go. Heaven power in verse he says great counsel, mighty indeed, all the things, and he recognizes that. And uh, so he gives him all this. Then uh, verse 27. When he finishes the prayer, actually, verse 26 says, Then the word of Adonai came to Yerbayahu, verse 27. The Lord says, Look, I am Adonai, the God of every living creature. And God asks the question, of course, he knows the answer, but it's a rhetorical question Is there anything too hard for me? And of course, the answer is no, because he does everything, he can do anything. So first Jeremiah says, there's nothing hard for you. And then God confirms it. There's nothing hard that I can do. So I want to stress on that. And we're going to look at different type of circumstances that you might be going through and, uh, and, and confirm what the word of God says. First of all, we're going to, look, we're going to say that God is able to handle any physical circumstance that you might be going through. Uh, Physical, first, problems with our bodies. Uh, uh, I'm reminded when I read this on Genesis 18, verses 9 through 14. Do you remember, you remember the story of Abraham and Sarah? Uh, she was barren. They were older. They could have no children. But God had promised them that he would make a great nation hmm, out of them. And here they are in their 90s, and one questions, how, you know, are you kidding me? We're almost, you know, we're, we're way past our, our, our birth giving, you know? And, uh, and uh, they said, this is not really going to happen. How are we going to have a great nation? And so you remember, 90 years old, Sarah, even at that time, even though she didn't believe she could do it, God did the miracle, and she gave birth to their son, Yitzhak, or Isaac, which means laughter. And you remember why? Because when uh, the messengers of the Lord spoke to Abraham, telling them that a year from now, uh, your wife will bear a child, she was listening uh, behind you know, the tent or in another tent, and she laughed. And so that's why they named it. Isaac, Isaac. And of course, I believe, you know, uh, that in verse 14 of that passage, uh, the word even is, you know, God says, is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Genesis 9, 18, verse 14, is there anything too difficult for Adonai? And of course, there is not. So that is one of the examples I remember. A similar example is in Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 5. 
through seven, when the promise of uh, the Lord came to uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that they would bear a child. And Luke 1, verse 5 through 7 says, the, the days of King Herod, King Yehuda, there was a Kohen named Zechariah, and he belonged to the Aviyah division. His wife was a descendant of Aharon. Her name was Elisheva. Both of them, verse 6, were righteous before God, observing all the mitzvot and ordinances of Adonai blamelessly. And verse 7, but they had no children because Elisheva was barren, and they were well, both well along in years. Well along in years. Some versions say well stricken in years. In other words, they were older. She was also barren and stricken in years. But the Lord made a miracle in her life as well, in her life. And Yohanan the baptizer, or John the Baptist, was born and bringing, it says, joy and laughter. If you recall when uh, Miriam, the mother of our Lord, went to see uh, her cousin, Elizabeth, and it says in verse 44 of Luke 1, for as soon as the sound of your greeting, when Miriam greeted Elizabeth, as soon as your uh, greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So even before Yohanan was born, John the Baptist was born, he brought joy to the family, and that was a great miracle. Of course, he became a great man of God. And then uh, we ask ourselves, how about us? What about you? Uh, what are you going through that maybe is a physical problem affecting you? I hope you prayed about it. I hope you trust the Lord for it. Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, because of pride or because a wrong concept of the teachings of the Word of God, uh, don't go to the Lord for, for physical problems. Uh, they feel, well, some people say, well, this is not, no, this is too little. I don't want to bother God with this. Well, be reminded there's nothing too small that God doesn't care. He cares all about our lives. And in the book of Jacob or James, in the uh, in the chapter five, there towards the end of the Brit Kadasha, uh, in James chapter five, uh, verse fourteen, James says, "Is someone among you ill?" He says he sh he should call for the elders of the congregation; they will pray for him and rub olive oil on him in the name of the Lord. And this is something that was customary. To rub oil, it had medicinal, uh, medicinal powers. It, it, has inf it helped people feel better. So it's, it's not either or, I always say it's prayer and medicine. God gave us prayer to go to him with, and, and ask for his power. We do that first and foremost. But he also gave us medicine. He also gave us doctors and the science of medicine to help us. He gave us ways out. And I think this is clear on that. It says, go to the Lord in prayer. Others pray for you. Rub oil means do the things that, are, that will help you to get better. Anointing with oil literally means to rub as a medicine over the body, as was customary then. So uh, if, and I would add this, if it is within his purpose, he can and he will heal you. He has the power to heal anything. If it is within his purpose, and I always say that, uh, uh, sometimes he chooses not to. We pray believing that he will do. That's the desire of our hearts. But we always have to say, if it is your will, if it is within your purpose, that is what we desire. But God has always best interest at hand and if he chooses not to because remember i always say this uh when jesus was on earth there were a lot of sick people 
Did he heal every sick people? No, he did not. He healed, he's healed many, but not everyone. Because this is, again, we have to trust God. And we always pray in faith, but we always pray in the will of God. And if it's not his will, he will give you whatever you need to endure whatever you're going through. He does that. Pray that he will heal. We pray that uh, that is our desire of our hearts. But we have to accept his will, which is always the best for us. So this is in regard to our bodies. What about other physical circumstances? What about... Uh, Problems with nature. God can handle any problem with nature. Uh, he has the power to handle any physical circumstance. Mark 4, 35 through 41, you remember the story of the storm uh, while Jesus and his disciples were on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. And those that have been in the Sea of Galilee in Israel maybe have experienced that uh, suddenly storms happen because of the way of the uh, that the Sea of Galilee has between certain elevations, uh, a storm can can happen without without any you know without any notification. It just happens quickly, and this is the case of Mark four thirty five and uh, through thirty forty one. You remember that uh, they were on the boat. He was Yeshua was sleeping in the back of the boats. Big waves started hitting the boat. It says started filling with water. The disciples woke up, the Lord, Lord, we're sinking. Uh, you know, they said, don't you care for us? Verse 38 of Luke, of Luke, of Mark 4, excuse me. Uh, don't you care that we're, we're sinking here, that we're going to die maybe? And uh, remember what uh, the Lord did. The Lord uh, woke up and he spoke against the storm. And because he's a Lord of creation, nothing can stop him. He's a Lord of creation. And uh, he told the wind to come down. And the storm disappeared. He ordered the wind and the sea to be still. And they obeyed because he's the Lord of nature. He is the God of creation. He was there during creation. So he controls it. And the passage says that... Uh, uh, you know, the Lord controlled it and the disciples even were scared because they realized, at first they were fearing the storm, then they were fearful because they realized, who is this who, who can control nature, the wind and the storm obey him. And so nowadays we see natural disasters around us, hmm? natural disasters, uh, there's floods, uh, there's all kinds of things. But we need to remember God is in control, not the weather network. Not the, the, uh, no, it's God. God is in control. He knows uh, what's going on with nature. He can, he, can, he can control anything that's going on. And he's able to take care of other material problems, other physical issues that have to do with, with physical, whether... Uh, it's your job or money issues that we're going through. Now with the inflation going up and all things going high and high, what are we going to do? And uh, hope that you're not in debt, but some might be in debt. So what are you going to do with your debts or problems with the house or different kinds of issues, time management, illness, other circumstances. Remember, God is powerful and more powerful than any of your problems. He is able to take care of any circumstance according to his will, but he's able to do it. He has a power. He's all powerful God. Trust him with any problems that you're going through and remain faithful as you're doing it. Hmm? You know, we pray for solutions. We pray for different things. Lord, we ask for our needs and this and that. But then we go out and we're not faithful to him or we're not obedient and following him in other areas. We need to uh, be faithful. Mm -hmm. As you ask, during in the midst of your problem, be faithful to him. Continue to serve him. Even when we don't see the end of the tunnel, when we don't see the solution, we don't see the way out. 
trust him. Remain faithful. He will act upon it. He will bring joy hmm? in his time, in his way. He will bring joy and you will rejoice with him. We were, uh, let me just share a, a answered prayer that we had this week. <coughs> Excuse me. We were, as I said, we came to help our daughter move. And, um, you know, she's sold her house here. She's closing uh, Monday. And uh, until last week, she wasn't sure if she had a place to go yet. And we prayed, and by the grace of God, everything went through. She has a place to go, beautiful place for her and the daughters, and, and uh, everything was going to be fine. God answers prayer in his time and in his way. Well, let's move on. So God not only can take care and handle any physical circumstance he's able to handle any moral circumstance as well and uh, we go back to uh, the book of Luke and uh, we go to chapter 19 and I'm reminded of this this uh, example that we find here you remember the story of Yeshua and Zacchaeus or Zacchae in Hebrew hmm? Luke chapter 19 it tells us that uh, the Lord was passing through uh, the city of Jericho. And uh, remember the story that multitudes were following him, were following him. There was one in the multitude named Zacchaeus or Zacchae, and he was a Jewish man. He was a tax collector. And, you know, they weren't popular then. There's not many popular nowadays either but uh he wasn't popular because uh you know sometimes they took more than uh what the law said and they kept part of it so he was he became rich by stealing by charging more than what the law said and he was considered a traitor because he was uh, collecting taxes for the Romans, right? And so it was a difficult circumstance. Uh, you know, the least of his problems is that he was short in stature, the Bible says in, in Luke 19. Uh, that was the least of his problems, but unfortunately that's why most people remember the story of Zacchaeus, that he was uh, a short man. But he had spiritual problems as well. And the Bible says that he sought to see Jesus. He wanted to see Yeshua. Uh, he wanted to hear him. So because of the multitude, because he was short, remember he uh, got up into a sycamore tree. Some versions say it was a fig tree. Most say it was a sycamore tree. Uh, if you've been to Israel uh, and you visited Jericho, there is one big sycamore tree and they, uh, they say, if it's not this one, it's similar to this one where he climbed up to see Jesus, and he saw him, and Jesus found him, he saw him, uh, the whole crowd, he pointed to him, and he told him to come down from the tree, because I want to visit you today, Jesus said, and the Lord visited Zacchaeus' house, but not only he visited his house, he visited his heart, and he visited his life, he influenced him, he changed him, he, he said, uh, the Lord visited him and, and, and he wanted to change him and transform him. And, and as a result of Yeshua's transforming power and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, he changed his heart. He changed Zacchaeus' heart and he transformed his bad, his bad moral habits. What I like to say is when Jesus changed your heart, it shows in actions it shows in a changed life it shows in your fruits in in changed habits and changed ways of life an old way of life and a new of, a way of life that's what we call the the new birth he was born again and uh, there was evidence of his new life there were tangible decisions that he made he said he uh, he used to cheat and, but he stopped cheating. He gave half of his belongings to the poor, it says in uh, Luke. And he says, and restored four times what he had taken illegally from anyone. Hmm? He gave four times. If I robbed you something, I'm going to not only return that, but multiply it by four. So there was 
a change. He used to cheat and steal, now he stopped doing it. And there was a big change. So God can take care of those uh, moral circumstances like Zacchaeus Paul. Same cases were of Rabbi Shaul huh? or the Apostle Paul. Uh, remember that he was a, a great example. He was, he was uh, chasing down followers of Yeshua. He was chasing them. He was putting them in prison, in Acts says. And some of them were dying, eh, persecuting. And the Lord appeared in you know, the, the, the trip to Damascus. And you remember the story how he transformed him because he had personal experience with the Lord Yeshua. And he changed him completely. So much so that at first, the first believers were, were kind of, uh, you know, reluctant to receive him. I said, wait a minute, this is the guy that used to persecute us and kill us because we believe in Yeshua. But yes, there was evidence in his life of a transforming power of the Lord in Rabbi Shaul's uh, life. Well, uh, I want to share a story, but before I do, ask yourself a question. Maybe there's something in your life, some little secret, something, some practice, some issue, some, uh, some bad habit that you only know about, and maybe the Lord knows, the Lord for sure knows about it, but maybe it's taking your sleep away. Maybe it doesn't let you sleep at night, and you worry, and you don't know what to do. And um, we've gone through these problems in the past. All of us have gone through these things. So all of us struggle. Uh, maybe you're going through something now that nobody knows, but it's, it's taking your sleep away. I am reminded of things. Maybe it's dishonesty. Maybe you're doing something that is not totally honest. Maybe... There is unfaithfulness to family members or something. Maybe there is, uh, you know, not telling the whole truth. And maybe there's lying. I hope there is not. Maybe there's some kind of addiction that you're struggling with. Whether it's to some medicine or to some too much TV watching or to some bad habit that doesn't, doesn't maybe it's controlling you. You can't get rid of well, I'm reminding of a story, and I want to share it. I was going to read it, but I decided to post it here because I read it, I learned about it many, many years ago, and it uh, always reminds me of things that uh, we have to be, watch out for. It's, the illustration it says it's called The Lark That Traded His Feathers for Worms, and uh, I just posted it there so you can, we can read it together. You can follow along. This story... It is not mine, but it says, a lark singing in the high branches of a tree saw a traveler walking through the forest, carrying a mysterious little black box. The lark flew down onto the traveler's shoulder. What do you have in that little box? Worms, the traveler replied. Are they for sale? The lark said. And the, I got to move this away, sorry. And the traveler said, yes, and very cheap too. The price is only one feather. So the like thought for a moment, I must have a million feathers, most of them quite small. Surely I will never miss one of them. Here's an opportunity to get a good dinner for no work at all. So he told the man that he would buy one. He searched under his wing for a tiny, tiny feather. He winced a little bit as he pulled it out, but the size and quality of the worm made him quickly forget the pain. So high up he, in the tree, he began to sing as beautifully as before. Well, the next day he saw the same man, and once again he exchanged a feather for a worm. What a wonderful way to get a dinner at no effort at all, the lark thought. Well, I'll skip the next day and the next and the next. I'm sure you're way ahead of me. In any event, he lost a feather each day and each loss seemed to hurt less and less. To begin with, he had a lot of feathers, but as days passed, he found it more difficult to fly. Finally, 
after the loss of one of his primary feathers, he could no longer reach the top of the tree, let alone fly into the sky. Indeed, he could no more than flutter a few feet in the air and then was forced to seek his food with a quarrelsome bickering sparrows. The man with the worms came no more, for there were no more feathers to pay for worms. The lark no longer sang because he was so very ashamed of his fallen state. This is how unworthy habits possess us. First, painfully, then more easily, until at last we find ourselves stripped of what lets us soar and sing. Sad story, but this is what happens. Bad habits start small and then grow in us slowly. Little by little, they take us down and away from God. Sometimes we compromise our faith. We compromise our biblical principles. We compromise the morals that the word of God teaches. So what is the solution for these things? The Bible says that confession, repentance, forgiveness. In that order, we confess whatever bad habit we have, whatever thing goes against God's will. We repent, we turn away from those things, show a change in our lives because if we want to repent, not only feel sorry, but we have to change our habit and our direction. And we ask God to forgive us and he cleanses us and he gives us another chance. Remember, God, the Lord Adonai, is the God of the second and third and more chances because that is his nature. That is who he is because he loves us. Don't live carrying whatever thing goes against God's will. Don't carry your pain, your sorrow, your shame. Turn it to the Lord. He can deliver you and I from any moral problem that we're going through. So God can take care of any physical problem. He's able to change. God can take care of any moral problem. That's why Yeshua died for you and for me. It is life so we can have forgiveness of any sin. No matter how big or small, he can change us. He can forgive us. He can give us a new beginning. And then thirdly, God is able to handle any spiritual circumstance that we might be going through or struggling with. He's more able than anything. You remember the story that comes to mind is John 3, uh, Gospel of John chapter 3, the story of Yeshua and Nicodemus or Nagdimon. And uh, you remember that story very well known. Nicodemus was a Jewish leader among leaders. He was a Pharisee. He was a prominent leader. He was a head of the uh, Pharisees and a teacher of the law, a Torah teacher. And you know how he came to Yeshua uh, at night, it says, in chapter 3 of John. So Yeshua at night because he wanted to compromise his position. He didn't want everybody to know about it. Saw him at night in a one-on-one, as far as we understand it, one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, and uh, he, I remember, he was prominent. Some Jewish people, you know, they have a problem dealing with Yeshua, so they have questions and things and do it secretly. They write us emails or they call us when nobody is, is watching. But that's what happened with him. But in spite of all this, and in spite of all his knowledge of scripture and all his religiosity or his religion, he still uh, needed to be born. He had a spiritual void in his life, hmm? a spiritual void that nothing, nothing could feel. And uh, the emptiness that he couldn't resolve by himself, just like all of us, just like maybe you were without 
uh, going through a similar situation before you met Yeshua. We all, the, say, uh, the saying goes, we all have a void in our lives uh, that only Yeshua can fill. And that's how Nicodemus felt. Well, he had a spiritual birth and he needed to be born again because he needed to be fulfilled and have a purpose in life that only Yeshua could bring to his life. So that's why the Lord told him, uh, uh, you know, that he needed this spiritual birth. And he says, how can, you know, how can a man be born again? It says, how can he be born again? And Yeshua told him, well, you're a teacher of the law. And you don't know this? Hmm. And so uh, in verse 10, it says, Yeshua answered him, you hold the office of teacher in Israel. You don't know this? He needed to be born again. And, and, and Yeshua led him to be born again. We know the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, only son, Yeshua HaMashiach. Uh, he gave his life so that all who trust him and believe in him will not die for eternity, but will have life everlasting with the Lord. In that sense, uh, I say, we're in a sense, huh? we're so, sometimes like automobiles. Now, I know that automobile technology is changing. We're going to electrical, we go other ways, but uh, when we talk about cars still using gasoline, well, we're similar in some way because cars have a gas tank and, you know, unless you put gas in it, it won't work. You might try water or milk or Coke. It doesn't work. Only gas. And uh, don't try this because you mess up your engine. But that's the way they're made. And in a sense, we're the same way. We try to make our lives happier and, and better by just, well, maybe if I get more money, maybe if I make more money, maybe if, maybe if I get a better job or work harder, my life will have more meaning. Or maybe if I spend more time having fun and pleasure, you know, I laugh because sometimes uh, when I sit with my wife at night and we want to watch a movie together, I, she chooses one of these romantic movies. And, you know, the phrase that they all say, how do you know you love this person or the other? Oh, because they make me laugh. And so people think that if, if, you, if somebody makes you laugh, that'll be That'll bring pleasure to your life and fulfillment to your life. Well, life is more than money and work and pleasure. These are you know, lies of Satan, the enemy that tells us, oh, you have all these things. You will be happy. You, you'll be okay. You don't need God. But the, that's not what God says. Don't believe Satan's lies. Because sometimes uh, we discover late that uh, all these things we, we can have, but still, not happy. Just that was a case of Nicodemus. He had everything, prominence and fame, and he was a teacher and leader, but none of that is enough. Only Yeshua can satisfy your spiritual needs and our spiritual needs. Only him. He can only, not only spiritual, it's all of our needs, but we're talking about spiritual, spiritual needs. So the question is, what is standing between you and the Lord? And I know we're talking to mostly believers among us and praise the Lord for that. But maybe uh, there's some that are not. Or maybe you're having doubts or difficulties that you don't find answers for. Or you might feel that God is distant. Huh? What is standing between you and the Lord? Hmm? Is it pride? Or is it an unhealthy uh, image of yourself? Listen, this is a great problem in our days. A lot of people have an unhealthy image of themselves. Some too high image and some too low image, what they call low self-esteem. But I like always to remind us of uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. It's a beautiful passage. You need to mark it down. You need to put it somewhere so that you are reminded of this passage. Look what it says in Romans 12, 3. Rabbi Shaul says, God's word for us is, for I am telling every single one of you 
through the grace that has been given to me, not to have an exaggerated ideas about your own importance. Instead, develop a sober estimate of yourself based on the standing, on the standard which God has given to each of you, namely trust. Some other version says, no one have a higher concept of himself or herself that they should have, but have a healthy one. So this passage is key because it says we shouldn't be too proud. Don't think of us, ourselves too much of ourselves. That's bad. But then it also says have the right image of yourself. In other words, don't just say, oh, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I don't feel good. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares. I'm no good at this. I'm no good for anything. No, you have to have a healthy image, the right image given to us by the Lord. It says, according, uh, develop a sober estimate of yourself based on the standard by which God has given each one of you trust and belief. In other words, you are worthy. You are worthy before God. He created you not only as a human being, but you're a child of the king because you are a follower of him. So have that image. You're not nobody. And you're not the greatest, you're just child of God. And be pray, be grateful for that. Huh? Have a healthy image. Hopefully that's what you are. I hope pride is not standing in, safe in, in the praise of God. Self-sufficiency is another issue. People that say, oh, I don't need God for this or for that. I can handle it myself. Even believers sometimes. I hope there's no one like that here but even believers sometimes say oh you know I, god is great but i don't want to bother him with this area of my life yes we need to let the lord be the lord of every area of our life maybe what's standing between you and the lord is unbelief or lack of faith or lack of trust in the lord yes i follow the lord yes he's my savior my messiah uh he's my lord i believe in him but I don't know about this. I don't know if you'll answer this prayer. Remember the book of Hebrews or Messianic Jews uh, is in chapter 11, verse 6 says, but without faith or trust, it is impossible to come to the Lord. Hmm. It is impossible to please the Lord and to come to know him because we need faith and trust. That's why we request it is impossible to know the Lord and trust him without faith. So I pray that this is not the case. Unbelief or lack of faith. Yes, you, we all go through difficult times. Uh, but remember, God can handle each one of them. Maybe your spiritual circumstance is apathy. Maybe you're not interested in, in spiritual matters. You lost that zeal. You lost that fire. You lost that excitement. <laughs> You know, with this pandemic that we've been going and dealing with and everything that we go through, we, well, maybe now well, we're not meeting in person. What are we going to do? Well, uh, don't lose its seal. Don't lose the interest in spiritual matters. Don't lose uh, interest in God's work and doing what God has called you to do, whatever that might be. Don't lose interest in God's work and in God's things. Those things might be keeping you down. God can handle each one. Whatever it is that you're going through, bring it to the Lord. Let him solve it because he can. Nothing is too difficult for him. Well, as we conclude, again, I don't know what you're going through. Some of you I do know, but maybe some of you I don't. Whatever it is, what is, what is it physical, moral, spiritual issue that is bothering you at this time? God's word assures us that there is nothing too hard for him or too difficult for God to handle. Nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Remember that and remind yourself of that. I am reminding myself of that every day. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. Trust him for it. Do whatever he tells you to do to solve the problem. I repeat it again. That's why I put it twice. Nothing can separate it. If it's in within his purpose, remember, 
He can free you of it. He will free you of it. He will answer your prayer. Remember how God answers prayer. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. Maybe God's answer is a different answer than what you expect. So you have to be open to follow him according to his will. I want to conclude with Matthew 11, verse, verses 28 through 30. Beautiful, beautiful passage that the Lord shares with us. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. I know that you know this. That is good to be reminded. The Lord Yeshua said, come to me, all you. That means all of us who are struggling and burdened. And I will give you rest, like a Shabbat rest, like only he can give rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. It doesn't say maybe. It says you will find rest for your soul. What does it take my yoke upon you? It means follow him. Follow what he says, uh, obey him, love him, pray to him, talk to him, read his word, take his yoke upon you, and you will find rest for your souls. Because it says in verse 30, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Maybe you feel you have a heavy load, but the heavy load is not from the Lord. The heavy load is what we carry, <laughs> the baggage that we carry in our lives whether physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, leave the load of his feet because his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He will have the answer for you. That is my prayer. That is my desire for you and for all of us today. I hope this blessed you today. Let me pray. Our Father, our King, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the confirmation and assurance that nothing is too difficult for you. You are the almighty God, Adonai Tzeva'ot, all-powerful God. So, Father, I intercede for my brothers and sisters and for myself, for my family, for all of us. Whatever it is that we're carrying, whether a physical issue or a moral issue, or a spiritual issue. Father, we leave it at your feet. Carry it for us. And give us the answer that it is best for us according to your will. We trust you. We trust you, Lord. And we believe that you can answer. Father, help us increase our faith and our trust in you. I pray for those that might be discouraged this day that might be struggling, family issues, jobs, or whatever, whatever they're going through, financial situations, insecurity, feeling lonely, feeling depressed, feeling abandoned, whatever it might be. Father, would you, would you feel their need according to your will, according to your word, according to your promise? And help us to help one another Lift up one another. Care for one another. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for hearing our prayers. May your will be done in our lives. Even this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.